So yeah, I'm Jared Dyer. I'm an assistant entomologist at, at uh, Cornell Crop Extension for Suffolk County. And so I was asked to speak about good bugs, bad bugs, and how we can live with them. And so this kind of got me thinking uh, about this framing. Uh, I think that a lot of us have viewing bugs as either good bugs or bad bugs. And so I kind of wanted to like begin to challenge that way of thinking through this presentation. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with like the reports of insect decline or as it's been termed like the media insect on um, the insect apocalypse um and as sensationalist it can appear at times um it does describe a very real problem a real trend that we've uh, been observing over the past few decades um there are many pieces of evidence um supporting the decline of insects over the past few years um, of course there's that one original study that kind of kicked off the whole um media craze the one from germany where it's uh, observed 75% decline in, in flying insect biomass. And what's like most alarming from this study uh, was that the study was not just from like an urban area or from a suburban area, even like a agricultural area. Um, this was done in a preserved area, so-called protected land. Um, so seeing that sharp decline over a relatively short period, 27 years was um, alarming. So it kind of got a lot of attention. Um, we've also seen declines in pollinators get a bit more specific. Um, in one study, they looked at a few, um, it was the meta-analysis, they looked at a few different studies and surveys of pollinators over the years and found that after, between 20, um, 20, oh, 2006 and 2015, um, there are 25% fewer bee species found in those surveys than ones conducted um, earlier in the 1990s. And so that was um, alarming. Um, and then even anecdotally, if you talk to your neighbors, talk to each other, uh, I'm sure you've probably noticed in your lifetime just driving the so-called um, windshield phenomenon, um, how you used to, back in the day, have your car covered with splattered insects on the windshield. Um, I remember myself, I went on a road trip with my mother and grandmother um, when I was 10. And even then, I remember distinctly at when we got to the rest stops, you would have to spend a few minutes wiping and cleaning off the shield windshield of all the insects that was splattered. But now I can go on road trips and you have the car windshield be completely clean. Um, so even anecdotal evidence like that, clearly it's pointing towards something um, being wrong with the general ecosystem. So shortly after that original German study, and that kind of called catapulted the insect apocalypse into the mainstream, um, the ins um, entomological, oh, sorry, the Entomological Society of America um, held a symposium at one of their annual meetings to kind of um, get all the big heads together and kind of see what was happening, put together a bunch of research to uh, more flesh out this phenomenon since we only had the one study. And um, some people had a lot of um, critiques of that one study um, that was done in Germany, but eventually produced a series of documents and a series of um, studies that they put together in a special collection um, that was published uh, about two years ago. And it looked at various facets of insect decline, trying to determine different causes, um, possible causes, what would be the possible consequences if it continued. And what really stuck out to me was in the introductory uh, paper, um, kind of leading off the whole collection, the very first words were um, kind of ominously, nature is under siege. And I think that really is true. And so what they ultimately concluded um, from that meeting was that the insect decline is caused not by just one driver, but many multiple things are kind of acting, as they say, um, death by a thousand cuts. Um, various things from pollution to agricultural intensification, invasive species, urbanization, um, climate change, and a lot of these drivers interact with each other. And there isn't one driver that's causing insect decline, but they're all interacting and um, leading to the situation that we have today. And so obviously it's very alarming because as the late E.O. Wilson said, um, insects are kind of the little things that run the world. Um, and he could have been more, no, more right. Um, they are very essential as transporters of energy um, to the higher levels of the um, food web. And Doug Tallamy, which you're probably from, really familiar with, has done a lot of work um, popularizing native planting and really um, getting the public to more conceptualized insects as a vital part of the landscape and using your landscape to promote um, insect growth and in life in general and being part of an ecosystem instead of just a more static part of the background. So quick activity, um, if you're able to put the things in the chat, um, just curious, what kind of words come up to mind when you hear the word insect? Um, just kind of 
off the mind immediately responds. Buzz, I see buzz, bug, okay. Crawly, crawling, the creepy crawly kind of a theme. Six legs, yeah. Squished. <laughs> if just spot lantern flies, yes, bug sprays, interesting. Stinging, okay. Interesting responses. So yeah, kind of a theme of like creepy crawly, stinging, or ways of controlling them, squishing them using bug spray. Um, pollinator, it's a good one. Glad to see that one. Um, yeah, I kind of put a few up here. So yeah, bug, small, tiny, creepy, crawly, like a lot of people said. Pest is a big one. Um, gross, evil, depending on who you talk to. Um, oh, bird food. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Um, dangerous, pollinator, like someone said, bite, sting, bad, good. And so we have a lot of these words, and a lot of them have a kind of a negative connotation. Uh, most of the time when we speak of insects, it's usually in a negative light. Um, and we don't typically feel the warmest toward insects, um, generally as a culture. And kind of, in some respects, it's kind of understandable. Um, insects and humans, they evolved um, very separately. Um, those paths of evolution diverged a long time ago, and they could seem almost alien to us. Um, now, even compared to other animals, they can seem alien. Uh, one of my pet peeves is hearing people say the word animals and insects as if insects are not animals. Um, arguably, they're the most animal animal um, or should be thought of that. And as a culture, we usually, in the media, we usually talk about insects as using negative connotations. Most times when we talk about it, it's in terms of being pests, just agricultural pests or medical pests and disease vectors like mosquitoes and ticks, especially here on Long Island. And invasive species, um, probably most often, if an insect ends up in the media or gets some news coverage, it's about invasive species and especially now with spiral lanternfly. And a lot of this is warranted, um, especially with spiral lanternfly and our other invasive species, of course. Um, it's unfortunate that the only time we're talking about insects is in this negative light. And occasionally we do talk about insects in um, a positive light, um, occasionally, but uh, when that does happen, it's usually um, very few far in between, and it's usually only for a few select insects, um, such as honeybees and our pollinators, like butterflies. Um, but even in these times when we do mention that, um, mention bug bugs in a positive light, it usually centers us. So we usually talk about pollinators in the context of agriculture. Um, we talk about um, butterflies as being pretty and we like them, even though they're not technically that good of pollinators usually. Um, and so even from like research and extension, um, we can slip into this framing of good bugs versus bad bugs. Um, this is just like a quick Google search I did. Uh, we'll put this together just kind of seeing that even in extension of research, we can slip into that dichotomy of good bugs and bad bugs. And so I kind of want to move beyond this kind of framing. I don't really think it's helpful. Um, it kind of limits bugs, insects, in the service that they provide, um, limiting them to what they can only do for us or what they don't do for us. Um, and instead, I think that kind of limits what they do for a general ecosystem and seeing them um, wholly as what their part in the environment. And so I'm going to talk briefly about some of those services. Um, so like one of the first kind of revisiting that initial question, what do you think of uh, when you think of insects? Um, I would hope, this is kind of what I hope you would um, take away from this and think of next time you think of insects. So what comes to my mind immediately is um, insects as recyclers. So a big part of uh, one of like the major ecosystem services that insects do play is as recyclers. It's kind of not often uh, mention or usually gets overshadowed by like more advanced things like pollinators. Um, so kind of going back to like some of my initial um, research, um, I started off in entomology studying aquatic systems, um, freshwater, macroinvertebrates, all the larval forms of of insects, and they play a hu huge part in um, stream ecosystems and specifically with leaf dump decomposition. Um, so there's this concept called the river continuum concept, and basically it describes the um, processing of organic matter as um, beginning with the headwaters and as it flows down to wider streams in the, the different um, feeding guilds you observe as you go from the headwaters downstream. 
So upstream in the headwaters and the mountains, um, you'll have a lot of um, input from the riparian vegetation, all those trees, um, especially now. Now is a great time for the streams as they all getting all that organic matter from the falling um, trees as they um, senesce their leaves. And those leaves are going to play a very important role, role in feeding the ecosystems of streams. Um, and so there'll be a lot of larval insects um, like mayflies and caddisfly larvae who will utilize that energy um, they play different roles. Some will feed specifically on the coarser material. Some will feed on the finer, finer material that gets processed and sent downstream. Um, others will graze on algae and more sun um, open areas as the stream starts to widen and becomes open. And so this is a huge um, surf that it plays with um, leaf decomposition. And then on land, of course, um, insects play a major role in deco decomposing um, organic matter, such as um, dead animals and uh, feces. And so some of this gets kind of overlooked. It's not really the most glamorous thing, but if you think about it, um, if there weren't flies in the world, there'd be a lot more um, corpses and dead bodies. And so they play a vital role in that. And so second area where insects are very important um just kind of going more to more familiar territory um of like doug talamy's work um is as, as food and so kind of going on that um insects are very vital too as a kind of a base to the energy pyramid um as doug talamy said you should think of your landscape as a giant bird feeder um many of these birds are heavily reliant on insects um insect as food, specifically as caterpillars. Um, Doug Talligan's mentioned many times that um, caterpillars have many of the nutrients that are really unique to caterpillars that birds can't really get from um, just seeds alone or even other insects. Um, caterpillars make great food since they're soft and can be easily shoved down the mouths of um, baby birds. And so how do you get insects? You have to plant the right plants. Um, again, the power of oaks. Um, they are heavily used, but we can't overlook the other species, our cherries, our willows, our birches, uh, maples, but really emphasis on native planting and um, establishing those connections between the specialists and their host plants. Um, a lot of people want to create a pollinator garden. Um, they want the pretty butterflies like monarchs and the swallowtails. Um, however, um, like to say, if you want a, a butterfly garden, you should start off with um, a monarch or a caterpillar garden. Um, if you want these butterflies, you need to attract, you need to plant plants that um, will attract the adults that will also allow them to overposit and um, raise caterpillars. And so you can get those butterflies later on. And kind of an interesting example um, that I came across of like the trophic cascades that can occur um, between uh, birds feeding on caterpillars is when back in 2021, when um, the East Coast had the brood X emergence of these periodic cicadas. Uh, um, some researchers decided to like, take a look at the effect of how this would shift the food web. So normally a lot of these birds would be feeding on the caterpillars, but when the cicadas emerged, a lot of them they observed would shift their feeding from caterpillar mainly to mainly cicadas. And this had downstream effects because since they're feeding primarily on the cicadas while they're emerging, um, there are a lot more caterpillars that survived. And so these caterpillars were able to feed, feed more on their host plants. And so they actually observed um, a decrease in plant biomass um, from that emergence. And so this kind of gave a sneak peek into what would happen if we did lose that connection. And so since this was just like a short um, once in 17 year event, it didn't really have any detrimental effect, but we can imagine um, if this prolonged, say from um, prolonged insect decline caused by um, humans, um, this could have severe effects on the vegetation. And of course, um, insects aren't just food for other animals, but they can be food for us. Um, the West is kind of an outlier in that insects aren't really, in our, insects aren't really considered um, food, but in other cultures, um, they can make up a huge portion of the diet in our um, commonly eaten as food. And so next, insects, um, as someone mentioned earlier, um, pollinators, Pollination is the big thing. Um, importantly, pollination is more than just um, European honeybees. Um, they're good for 
cultivated landscapes. Some crops need them. Um, they're good in apple orchards where they will not have much open forage. And while bees can't really um, do the commercial standard of the job, but um, pollination is much more than just European honeybees. You need native bees, you need your squash bees, uh, bumblebees, your sweat bees. And so even in these commercial settings, um, native bees can be a valuable um, asset. They can subsidize pollination from um, imported honeybees and provide up to um, one third of the pollination done in those orchards as well. Um, one study found recently done by, in Cornell, by Cornell um, found over a hundred wild bee species in New York orchards. Um, in, the, in these orchards where these wild bees were present, they actually had higher fruit set um, by the end of the season. And so obviously you need these um, native pollinators. Um, they're very critical to um, not just our food supply, but pollinating the um, various plants in the ecosystem that um, they specialize to uh, pollinate and uh, interact with. And so like one of my favorite native bees are the cellophane bees or crolides. They're very early um, ground nesting bees. Most of our bees are solitary and most of those solitary bees are ground nesting. Um, they emerge very early in spring for a few weeks to mate and briefly forage. Um, they're called cellophane bees because they can make these incredible um, water resistant, microbe resistant, um, plastic like material in their brood cells. Um, so they'll use these in their burrows to coat um, their brood cells where they have their um, offspring. And so that's where their name comes from. Um, so it's bees like this that are very critical to pollination. Um, another interesting native bee, the small carpenter bee, these are different from the larger carpenter bees that might be um, you might find flying above your house doing some structural damage. And even that structural damage is usually minor. Um, the small carpenter bees um, can really kind of stress the importance of leaving um, empty stems for their nest. Um, that's where they lay their brood cells. And we can't give all the attention to the bees as well. Um, second to bees, um, flies are very important pollinators, although they don't really get um, as much attention as bees. They're not as cute or cuddly, um, but they are very important. Uh, pawpaws, um, everyone loves pawpaws. If you haven't tried one, they are fantastic. Um, but they are fly pollinated primarily. Um, chocolate is uh, fly uh, fly pollinate as well, even though it's not grown here. Um, it's pollinated by a midge. Um, there are surfeit flies, which are also not only just po good pollinators, um, but also very good um, natural enemies of aphids and other soft-bodied insects. And kind of going off of that, um, insects are really good uh, predators and bowel control agents. Um, and kind of similar to their role as food, um, they play a larger part in the ecosystem as kind of uh, suppressing some populations um, so it stays in balance. And so a lot of my background is with biological control with um, just like intentionally releasing or like augmenting um, insect populations um, with natural enemies. Um, I really like this quote that kind of describes biological control as seeking, um, using nature as a partial ally, not as a total adversary. Um, a lot of times bio control is used with invasive species um, that we introduce. And so it's kind of a way of repairing that damage and reestablishing that connection um, that was lost. Because a lot of times these invasive species are able to proliferate because they have no good natural enemies here in the new range. And so using classical biological control, you um, reintroduce that good predator to restore that balance and hopefully knock down the levels back to a non detrimental um, amount. And so here we just have pictured, um, here's the actual hover fly larvae, a serpent fly larvae. Um, they're very tiny, kind of worm-like, but they're very ferocious predators. Um, they can completely decimate a leaf full of aphids. Um, of course, we have the lady beetle, um, kind of the poster child for biocontrol. Um, and then a lacewing larvae. Um, also goes after soft bite insects. And then down here we have a few um, aphid mummies, they are the, these are all parasitized by an aphidious wasp. Um, so these wasps can be extremely effective in um, controlling aphids. Um, they'll lay an egg in the aphid and then eventually that um, 
egg will hatch and they'll develop in that body and kind of um, emerge from the aphid, leaving behind its hollow musk or what's called a mummy. Um, kind of goes in theme with Halloween from yesterday. Um, yeah, some more natural predators, um, dragonflies are also fearsome predators, not really used in biological control, um, but naturally in ecosystems, they are good predators um, to have in the environment. Uh, a few more, um, the chinid parasitoid, this goes after squash bugs. Um, so if you've seen them, they kind of look like stink bugs and they're kind of related to stink bugs. Um, but yeah, squash bugs, these chinid flies will lay an egg um, you typically on the outside of the insect, and that insect will again parasitize the inside and um, later emerge. Um, here are some lady be here's a lady beetle larvae, um, again going after I mean, it's elderberry aphid. Um, so again, these insects they play a vital role in keeping um, a lot of these um, populations down, um, whether it's in agriculture just naturally, because you can imagine, especially with aphids, they kind of grow exponentially. So without these predators. Um, they could completely overwhelm and kill a plant. Um, actually, right now, I'm in the process of trying to maintain an aphid colony for one of our experiments, and um, they grow very fast, and without those natural enemies, they can go through plants very quickly. Um, here's another up-close shot of a surfer fly attacking a cabbage aphid. Um, so again, um, oh, here's one of another wasp by that like uh, cicada killers. So they kind of got a bad rap, especially when a lot of uh, media attention was put on the so-called murder hornet or, or Asian giant hornet, or I believe it's now called Northern giant hornet. Um, it was recently given an official common name. Um, but yeah, cicada killer was kind of um, lumped in with that. Um, people often mistake these for murder hornets. Um, it's usually either this or a European hornet gets a mistake for it. Um, and just to be clear, the Asian giant hornet is not anywhere near here. Um, currently, I think Actually, eradication efforts for that on the West Coast have been pretty successful so far. Um, but yeah, these cicadas are pretty gentle, actually, in nature. Um, they only go after cicadas. Um, they're pretty interesting to watch. You can watch them dig their burrow and drag the cicada into the hole. Uh, and so kind of the last area I wanted to touch on is insects are really good. What I call this broad category of libraries of knowledge, because um, they can do really amazing things and things that we've, as humans, have kind of taken advantage of kind of an obvious example are um, silkworms. Um, these were heavily used in the Silk Road, um, became very lucrative. Um, it's kind of amazing how they're able to make this um, very fine material that's very sought after. Um, and the silkworm moth is kind of impressive, kind of as a domesticated species. It is completely flightless and completely dependent on humans. Um, for its transport. Um, kind of other things, coastal dye. Um, this is derived from a scale insect. Um, it can be found in um, a lot of food as a food colorant or as um, as a food colorant and uh, natural dye. Sorry, Oops. had a cat interruption. Um, shellac is another um, scale insect um, derived product from the lac bug um, used as a coating. Um, so insects are able to engineer a lot of these impressive compounds that we're trying to study and um, use in biomimicry. Um, the plaster or plaster bee or cellophane bee, as I mentioned earlier, that they make this kind of natural plastic or cellophane um, for its brood cells that's being studied as a possible um, plastic alternative. Um, so yeah, insects are very critical. Um, we need as pollinators, as, um, recyclers, as, <laughs> sorry, as pollinators, as recyclers, as food for a general ecosystem. And it can also produce all these amazing products. Um, but of course we still have to, so clearly we can't live without them, but we still have to. Um, learn to live with them. If people have a lot of concerns about stinging insects and um, medical pests, um, obviously. And so sometimes when people go to create pollinator gardens or decide to um, kill their lawn and um, plant native plants and let it go um, rewild it, um, they might get complaints from neighbors, or even with themselves, about possible risks from stinging insects or things from um, 
medical tests like mosquitoes and ticks. Um, so it's clear we can't live without them, but how do we live better with them? Um, so kind of addressing this, this is just the resource um, from Rutgers. It's very um, helpful in finding attractive pollinator plants. Um, but in terms of stinging insects, a lot of people get um, kind of worried if they plant a lot of pollinator attractive plants that they'll attract um, a lot of stinging insects, a lot of wasps in particular. A lot of them can be very scary. Um, if you don't know, if you're only associated with wasps, it's like with yellow jackets. Um, however, most solitary wasps and bees are very gentle. Uh, most of them are very too preoccupied with foraging um, to even really bother with stinging insect humans. Um, they obviously can sting, um, but usually only provoked, and you shouldn't really be worried walking through it, um, getting stung by most of these solitary insects. The defensive bees and wasps can be a little bit more defensive um, naturally because they're usually defending a nest or their brood. Um, but while foraging, which is where they're, which is where they'll, they'll, they'll mostly be doing um, when they're in a pollinator garden or in an open field, um, they're usually not really threatening when they're foraging. They're more focused on that foraging, like their salt, like their solitary counterparts. Um, and so only when they're near their nest and that nest is disturbed is when they can really get defensive and when stinging becomes a serious issue. So my personal philosophy with it is if the nest is not in an area where humans are uh, frequently occupying, I usually like leave it be. Um, at my old house, um, I had a nest that kind of formed a little bit near the door, but not at the door. Um, it was still near where my car was parked, but I left it there. I'm kind of just gradually watching it through the season. And every time I would go to my car, just look at the nest, they look back at me and nothing would ever happen really. And it got through the whole summer, wasn't ever stung. Um, so yeah, you can live with, in peace with these um, insects. You just have to kind of make the conscious decision to pick and choose your battles essentially. Um, obviously if it is in the door, like in an area where children play or in like a walking path or a ground nest, um, that should be removed. Um, but if it's just hanging around in a tree, um, shouldn't be too worried about it. Um, another big thing are ticks. Obviously, a lot of people worry if they um, rewild their yard or especially if they like leave the leaves, which is common um, this time. Um, that can create a lot of perfect tick habitat. And so they're concerned about that, especially here on Long Island. Um, that was one of the um, hardest things to kind of confront when I first moved here. Um, I was originally in Virginia and originally from Maryland before that. Um, and we had ticks, but they weren't as bad as um, they are here. Um, and so kind of adjusting that has been kind of a challenge, a learning curve. Um, but really the best way to kind of deal with this is to rather than spraying your yard or the perimeter even, um, it's just really, if you're gonna spray, spray your clothes rather than the perimeter. Um, a lot of times these sprays for ticks and mosquitoes in particular aren't really uh, affecting that local population. Um, a lot of so-called mosquito sprays only target the adults. Um, you aren't really targeting the more susceptible, more important stage, the larvae. Um, so a more practical strategy for controlling, for mosquito control would be to um, remove those standing bodies of water if you have a bird feeder, perhaps just turn into a fountain or just remove it entirely. Um, and then for ticks, my go-to is usually permethrin. Um, you can always use your um, spray of choice, but I usually just treat my clothes and boots um, and then naturally wearing long sleeve pants, tucking your um, pants and your socks. Those are usually the most effective and most best controls um, for ticks in general. Um, and also doing a tick check. Um, people are surprised, I'm most surprised how often people don't do tick checks and then later find the tick later. Um, another interesting thing about ticks is most tick-borne diseases take a while to actually transmit. So people sometimes will like bring ticks to the lab, um, freaking out like they found tick on me. I need to get this tested. It hasn't even really bitten them yet, so it could even transmit the disease. Um, typically, it'll take at least 24 hours for most tick diseases like Lyme disease to actually transmit. Um, so even if it does bite you, um, if you find it quickly, um, the, last, the risk of of getting Lyme disease or any other tick-borne disease um, is pretty low. Um, the one exception to that that I found out recently is alpha-gal. Apparently that can um, 
be transmitted fairly fast um, from Lone Star Ch Ticks. Um, alpha gal, so called meat aller red meat allergy from Lone Star Ticks. Um, I've heard that can transmit in minutes to a few hours. Um, so that might be um, more, more caution with that specific species. Um, and again, most tick um, disease porn illnesses um, take a few hours at least of sustained biting and feeding to successfully transmit. Um, and then like another cultural control for managing ticks in your yard, if you have a bird feeder, um, perhaps removing that bird feeder during the um, insect feeding season, so only keeping it during the winter, um, or else those seeds will attract rodents which can bring in more ticks to that environment. And another simple thing is just um, keeping the grass short and removing that leaf litter in areas where you do plan on being. Um, Doug Tallamy in a lot of his work recommends, doesn't um, kind of says, you don't have to have your entire yard be native plants. If you do have your lawn, you can use it as like a pathway. And which kind of, what's just kind of the design I like most. Um, I do like those natural pathways of using turf as it should be as a good walking ground um, through your garden, through your natural garden, or putting mulch down instead as a path. And so using that as a way to kind of um, keep tick populations down where you are going to be walking through um, is a good way of keeping that down in the natural garden. And so kind of closing, um, I hope that in this kind of gives a glimpse of what insects are kind of outside of what, um, outside of what um, we usually frame insects as good insects or bad insects. Um, they are vital. We need to live with them. We can't really live without them. Um, they contribute a lot of ecosystem services and there are ways to have your native gardens and native landscapes without um, succumbing to risks from stinging insects or these uh, mosquitoes or ticks. And so if you really like just take, take the time to appreciate um, how these insects live and the natural um, kind of knowledge they can generate, um, that will be best for everyone. If you have any questions, um, you can always feel free to answer emails. Um, my Cornell email.